And uh, I got to start with uh, Twitter, former Twitter participant, at 321 Noel. You guys see this guy? 321 Noel. Mm -hmm. Put out a little uh, tweet the other day, 827. August 27th at 11.42 a.m., he got on the uh, got on the old Twitter. And at 321, Noel said, if Florida State loses to BC this weekend, I will eat dog out of a red Solo cup with a spoon and post a video of me doing it. Book it! Exclamation point. <laughs> well... Well, well, we did book it. Guess who no longer oh. is a Twitter subscriber? Yeah. yeah. At three, two, one, no, no longer exists. <laughs> the sluice over at Barstool or uh, I need to say on it because um, he got served a red solo cup. He and all of the Seminoles, a red solo cup. <laughs> Uh, he apparently is saying, see you next year. He's just done. Uh, but he's gone. We don't know. Do you have to eat it? Do you not? Pat, does this man have to eat <laughs> for our enjoyment or do you just quit? I think he did the right thing. Just run. He, he just got run. served a red solo cup of shut up. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, this one that much like the Seminoles themselves, a lot of talking, not a lot backing it up. We heard all offseason, Florida State too good for the ACC. Now is not just 17th and last, but 0-2 in the league. And it's going to be a while till anybody else gets down to 0-2, I think. I haven't looked at all the schedules. So 3-2-1, Noel, excellent time to disappear. <laughs> you know what? Erase your online profile and keep it low for the long, for the foreseeable future. Uh. Yeah, I um, I wish we. Uh, I think it'd be great to to have this on the um, on the pod. Have him on the pod with the solo <laughs> cup and just oh, shoveling in, oh. shoveling in dog. Poop. We will host uh, it if you if you decide right, to yeah. fulfill your whatever yes. this is. Would is we it be worth violating any getting, like FCC regulations? I don't probably <laughs> health standards. Is it, Maybe yeah. it'll be worth him. Maybe he's a pod listener. It's worth him to get on the pod to do this thing. But, um, uh, man, yeah, I, uh, you know, who look like dog hmm. the Knowles. <laughs> I'm sure we're going to get to it, but, but wait, what wait. stunned me about, about that game was not the quarterback play, but the, the fact that they were just gashed on defense. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of heat on DJU, who certainly has not turned out to be what the Knowles were expecting, but, uh, he does not play defense, and uh, he uh, this this was Boston College just utterly dominating. Uh, two hundred and sixty three yards, fifty two carries, thirty nine minutes of play. Uh, dominant offensive line position. The defensive line of Florida State was supposed to be this vaunted crew. Didn't happen. The offensive line for Florida State didn't happen. Twenty one yards on sixteen carries. I can't say you blame it all on QB. This program is uh, it's a mess right now. It, we'll get to BC because it was a great win and a, and a tone setter and a statement for Bill O'Brien nationally, much like Georgia Tech was a week ago. Florida State has served its purpose. Um, plaintiff number one is 0-2, as Pat pointed out on, on Twitter. Plaintiff number two is 0-1. AC, the rest of the ACC <laughs> kind of enjoying all of this. Um, too good for the ACC. They ain't beating anybody else. They ain't beating anybody. Uh, both programs in complete disarray since they decided to sue their conference. Uh, I mean, I don't know who's more miserable right now, Clemson fan or Florida State fan. Although I don't know any Clemson fans that had to run for their life, so they need a red solo cup full of <laughs> of that. So at least, yeah, <laughs> Clemson yeah, fan okay. keeping their head about them a little bit better, a little more, yeah, a little, a little better, a little better. Where's Tyler what? from Spartanburg? A little more understandable right. to lose to the yeah. two-time yeah. national yeah. champion board of Georgia Bulldogs than Georgia Tech and Boston College, too. Yeah, fair point. Yeah. Fair point. When, uh, Pat, what do you think of this, this? The Seminoles here? Yeah, they. I mean, it was. I thought a really like pretty surreal scene to see Boston College of all programs 
go into Tallahassee and take mercy on Florida State at the end of the game by taking a knee at the five instead of putting another touchdown on the board to basically say, all right, our work here is done. We have dominated Florida State, and we're going to take it easy on them. We're going to avoid humiliating them further. So that was profound statement on both programs. But for Florida State, this is just, it seems like to me, a an offseason of gross miscalculation of what they thought they were good at, of what they thought they needed, of who they are. I mean, it's just astounding to me that they could crater to this extent right off the bat and lose two ACC games. And they were, we said, they were lucky to really be in the game to the, with, to the end against Georgia Tech. And then they got flat out dominated by Boston flipping college here. So the line play is atrocious on both sides, as you guys pointed out. They cannot stop the run. They cannot run. And when those two things are true, you're in a world of hurt in college football. It's just hard to fix during a season. You can get marginally better. You can maybe scheme some things up to cover up some deficiencies. But if you can't run and you can't stop the run and opponents know it, that's the easiest thing to exploit. So Florida State has got a long season ahead, and that fan base is actively losing their minds given the the high horse they rode in on. Yeah, I think they've allowed through two games uh, almost 500 yards of uh, rushing. Um, this just kind of stunning, uh, especially again uh, noting the competition that they played. So, still left on the schedule are certainly plenty of teams like um, Miami and Clemson and, and those type of teams. So, you uh, you wonder, you know, what uh, what the end record might look like for uh for Florida State. It's just surprising. And and I think um Mike Norvell was asked after the game about a quarterback change or if he thought about a quarterback change, didn't really give a direct answer. But you do wonder if uh there's something that um I think the crowd was chanting for the backup, Brock. Yeah, we uh, want Brock Lynn. We want Brock, yeah. 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 Um certainly not the start that uh DJU I'm sure imagined um with this uh, Florida State transfer. 17 transfers into Florida State. Last year, they hit. Last year's team was transfer heavy, and, I mean, they hit. Now, a lot of those guys are there two years, um, but some weren't. And uh, it was like a straight flush and bang, you're 12-0. and 0. I think this is – we may see more of this type of spiking of teams. You live by the portal, you die by the portal. It, it, you might hit on these guys, but like when you're building a football team through recruiting, you're spending multiple years scouting players, getting to know players, getting to know their parents, their high school coaches. What is this? This bang. Let's we got this guy. What do we think of this guy? The portal is a it's a craps game. It is. You got three days. And you got to just grab whatever you can get. And I don't know that you can. I think the challenge is how do I find these guys that are going to work together that aren't here just for the money, who aren't looking and saying, oh, I mean, look, the, like the entire Florida State defensive mm -hmm. line last year is playing for the L.A. Rams now, or at least two of them. But, you know, um, it's like, hey, I'm just going to pop in. I'll be in the pros in a year. I'll make a quick, you know, half million or whatever I'm going to get. And that's their fight mindset, not where to build a team to win. Like, how do you put, this is football. It's not fantasy football. And so I think this is the challenge for, for all teams. And we're, uh, we've said all along, like, this is the, this is the bit. How do you, how do you put a team together in two weeks in the portal? Now there is a lot with Florida state. They've recruited well, but clearly they haven't recruited well enough. You'd rather build through recruiting that, and then pick, pick your spots than sit there and say, we need a big overhaul. We're just going to hit it every single time, and we're going to be 11-1 and one every single year. I don't know that that's possible. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Dan, that, that there is a, a poker hand sort of uh, dynamic at work here where you may get dealt great cards, you may get dealt bad cards. You may play your hand well, you may play it poorly. Florida State could be an example. TCU 2022. Uh, they've done, they, I'm not sure they're like massive portal, but 
they went from 14 and 13 and two, I believe it was to uh, losing record last year. Um, we'll see if they're rebounding this year. Michigan State, when they hit it with uh, Kenneth Walker the third, and then bounced out of that group, and it was like, ooh, yikes, what happened? So I, I think there's probably plenty of reason, and coaches aren't dumb, they know this, to believe that the main thing we've got to do is work through high school recruiting and then supplement as best we can and be smart about it and be judicious, maybe get you know guys we already have existing relationships with because – you know, when you're swiping Tinder, as you as you alluded to, and it's like, ah, oh, that looks good. And then you, you go on the date, it's like, oh my gosh, this person's a psychopath, you know, or whatever. <laughs> That's just not gonna work. Uh if you if you're making decisions on the fly based on on kind of panic shopping, it it just you're setting yourself up. Well, and uh, I think it was Saban who said it on on game day, right? If you if you spend your money, your your portal money, your NIL money on the portal on portal players on the wrong players, if you invest in the wrong players out of the portal, you'll be shit out of luck. Um, and maybe that's that's what we've seen from some teams. Uh, maybe that's what we see down in Tallahassee. Small sample Heisman for poo theme of the yeah. Day. Small sample mm-hmm. Heisman for SHIT. It's getting a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of play this week. Well, okay. <laughs> One of the stories of, of this early season, two players from the Pac-2, two quarterbacks that were left behind, DJU from Oregon State, Cam Ward from Washington State. One goes to Miami. Cam Ward looks unbelievable. One goes to Florida State. DJ doesn't look so good. You know, and it's like, which guy did you want last year? I think most people wanted Cam Ward more, but you would not think that that disparity would be so significant. So that is the situation. Uh, quickly on Boston College, the the, the the they look great. I mean, they they I don't care what be, FSU may be a six win team. I don't care. For Boston College, this was an unbelievable night to showcase. Bill O'Brien, we said I thought pound for pound was the best hire of the off season. I'm not saying he's a better Alabama got Kalen DeBoer right off the national championship. Better hire, right? But Alabama's going to get that coach. Boston College got a guy who was a successful coach at Penn State under unbelievable circumstances, a four-time playoff trips with the Houston Texas, won a couple games, worked for Bill Belichick and Nick Saban, coached Heisman winners, Tom Brady, Super Bowls, national like playoffs, and had almost 100% name recognition because of all his work with the New England Patriots up in, in New England where they need to have their base and is from Boston. Unbelievable hire. You could see the stamp of this program. They they got one penalty. The 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 lines were tremendous. Two kids from Norwell, Mass, dominating Florida State. Never thought I'd see that. Just saying. End of the game. They made a point of it on the on. It was a it was an NFL way to end the game. Games one, take a knee. College. I mean, you know, we see <laughs> Colorado still throwing the ball downfield, trying to. People are trying to pad stats. They're trying to score. What they don't know how to do it. O'Brien's like, got the cal. Uh, no, we're done. We're done here. NFL, you win by one, you win by 100. Doesn't matter. Um, You could see this was a professional-looking operation at Boston College. I'm not going to put them in the playoff or anything, but, boy, that's that's a nice day one return on investment for a program that has not seen much since, you know, there was like the red bandana victory over USC. There was some great years with Matt Ryan. It hadn't been a whole lot. hadn't been a whole lot. No, it was an awesome moment for them. Uh, just really a very impressive all-around performance. Uh, and you're right. I think we were all very high on the O'Brien hire to begin with. I think it was a real coup for BC to get him, and he's such a good fit there that, you know, you give him a chance. And, and one of the best things, obviously, that he did, like some other places where new coaches came in, uh, thinking specifically of, of Arizona, you keep you keep your quarterback, you know Thomas Castellanos. I, I don't know if there was a huge market for him, but surely some people in in the portal would have been interested in him. He's short, but he's a very good dual threat player. And I think if you give Bill O'Brien a quarterback to build around, he'll he'll make it work, whatever the quarterback style is. And and he's a dual threat guy, but he was very effective. Seventy three yards rushing and a touchdown, one hundred six yards passing and two touchdowns there. And let him let him build an offense that way, and then he's gonna yeah have a professional 
organization. It's just going to be buttoned up. It's going to be well run. You're going to add players where you can. And BC is going to probably be as good as it can be as long as it can keep Bill O'Brien there. Yeah, I was. Uh, I wonder if Bill O'Brien, who obviously known, you know, for his his offense, and uh, I, I wonder if he looked at watched. I'm sure they watched that Georgia Tech game, right? And was like, oh, this is this is easy. We're just going to run the ball, <laughs> and uh, and man, they they just pounded it, and uh, and in an assortment of ways too. Uh, I was pulling up a stat. They ran the ball. This is crazy. They ran the ball 12 times on first down. Boston College did. Uh, and, uh, and it, it was like the opposite game plan of what Florida State did. Um, and it, it just didn't run the ball, didn't give, didn't give uh, the ball to the tailbacks at all. And BC did the opposite. And they were just so patient in doing it. They, you could tell they didn't mind doing it. Uh, they had confidence in doing it. They gained almost, um, what, uh, five yards of rush. Um, it was just yeah, – 5.1. It was, it was dumb. Yeah, it was incredible. Um, and they, they again, just you, you're talking about a, a coach who, who obviously knows a lot about offense and schemed up well and thought, you know what, let's not get cute here and uh, let's just pound the ball. That's that's what Georgia Tech did, and, and uh, that's what you got to do, obviously, against Florida State because they can't stop it. Margins in the NFL are so tight, you rarely get a mismatch where you're just like, we can do this, but when they do, they'll do it all day. <laughs> Uh, it's nothing, and, and they he knew, and it was the interior of that line. Yeah, I mean, they just went yeah. straight up that that key. There was a moment in that game where FSU got it uh, to a touchdown, to one score, thirteen, yeah. maybe twenty one, and then uh, there was a bad, pen stupid penalty on a kickoff, and then it was just right up the middle, touchdown. Like you know, six, seven plays later, touchdown. Um, Quote of the weekend, we had some guys play their butts off tonight, and we're sitting here again. We're sitting here talking about the same things. Pound the table. Brian Kelly channels my mood while I do this podcast every time with you two. <laughs> you are my spirit animal, Brian. What is going on? I'm angry. Uh, you're both out in Vegas. Various levels of sobriety. Uh, speaking of bad trip, there's been bad trips to Vegas. People have had bad trips to Vegas. <laughs> they yeah. left with regret, yeah. <laughs> lack of yeah. purpose, injuries, <laughs> pounding tables. You see, them at the, you, you see them at the airport, Dan. You they're, do they're sitting at that oh. gate, you know, oh. and they're just their face. Just, they're just wearing it. They're wearing Vegas on yes. their face. I used to do this trip where I'd go to uh, Yahoo yes. meetings up in Sunnyvale, California, in the Bay Area. And there was a flight. I could take a red eye back, but I had to go San Jose to Vegas and get the red eye. And I would show up to get the red eye in Vegas. And I would have not been in Vegas, right? I'm just connecting. Mm -hmm. And you get yeah. to the, your, the midnight flight back. To, and it was like the people just sprawled out. Just, <laughs> just <laughs> work. You're like, yeah. man, this town. When you come in with sober <laughs> eyes, you're like, oh, no. Look at these people. <laughs> They're just done. Puddles are just, they're sleeping yes. on the floor. Guys got, I just blew my mortgage. Like they smell a smoke in there. You're just like, oh, this flight is awful. What does this town do? Pat, what is happening with Brian Kelly? He's angry. Uh, I will say I, I barely did Vegas. I, you know, I flew in Sunday morning. Wasn't feeling very good. Heroically did the overreaction podcast with you all and then covered the game and then flew out Monday didn't place a single wager. And I, I, the, when I got to the airport, they originally said, um, my flight out was D 42. I go to D 42 and that actually is a flight that's going to Baton Rouge. And yes, the defeated detritus that was slumped around at that gate. Oh, that was a rough bunch. That was a bunch that came in with high hopes and more money and left broke and zero and one so that 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 was a rough rough scene there but um you know it was a really good game i thought it was a very good game i i didn't walk away from that down on lsu and down on brian kelly uh really you know i mean i know they they are zero and one three years in a row now with kelly and they've lost they, they take on these good games and they don't win them they lost to florida state twice and now they've lost to uh to usc and certainly in 
two of the three of those season openers under Kelly, you could make a case they could have, should have won. Absolutely the first one against Florida State. And then this one, you know, they had the lead and they gave up two touchdown drives in the last half of the fourth quarter. And I get him being angry and I get LSU fans being angry because that's what they do when they lose. But they're fine. They're okay. They're going to be fine, I think. And I, but I'm, I'm more impressed with USC than I am distressed by LSU. Yeah, same. L, uh, USC's defense was kind of the the star of the game in a way for me. I mean, obviously Miller Moss played incredibly well. Both quarterbacks did, but the uh, the improvement um, in USC's defense just in tackling, especially up front. Um, and they had some one on one tackles too in space. Um, that they made that last the last few years just didn't seem like a USC program uh, makes. Um, so that that was huge to see for for them and for their future uh, this year. But Pat might feel the same way. We're up in the press box of that game, and it's seventeen to thirteen. You know, late in the third quarter, early in the fourth quarter, and LSU twice takes over with drives up four. And they started to run the ball well, a little better, got it going. And you thought, well, this is over. Like, and we were talking with the people around me in the press box. Like, we've seen this show before about to be like a nine play, you know, 70 yard drive with seven runs and LSU's going to score a touchdown and win the game and put it away. And that's, that's what felt like usually happens um, in a game kind of like that, especially with USC. But give, give it up again, going back, circling back to the DF, USC's defense. LSU has not had a third and one around the 40 on one of those drives, lost a yard. LSU had a third and maybe six um, in in a great open field tackle to hold it to three yards and force another punt. So give it up for, for USC's defense. That was impressive. But yeah, the LSU folks who I heard from quite a, a few after the game were, were not happy. Um, and uh, – you know, I think if you're an LSU fan, you take away from that game that offensively you have some really big weapons. You have a quarterback that is, is pretty sharp. And defensively, um, you know, I think you're improved from last season. Uh, it feels like that. It seems like they're improved. The one issue was late in the game. Um, you couldn't run the ball. And, and you, struggled to, you struggled to run the ball the whole game. Really, and that was the that was the thing that came out of that game for L, the LSU side. While USC is probably celebrating having the offensive weapons that it thought and having an improved defense, I think LSU probably came away from that game same thing, right? Improved defense, offensive weapons, but oh my goodness, we can't run the ball. And with a veteran, um, experienced offensive line, one of the most experienced in the country could not run the ball late when it mattered, and that was kind of the difference. And that is demoralizing when you look at LSU's schedule. Yeah, I thought it was a great game. Uh, it was a great game to watch. I'm sure it was a great game to be at live on TV. It was just really great uh, quarterback play by Miller Moss and uh, Nuss Meyer um, back and forth. You didn't know what was going to happen. And it's sort of, to me, this is what we want, particularly as we get into this playoff, like – this doesn't hurt anybody. Right. You know, you don't have to do this. Let's rig the schedule to go 12 and 0 or 13 and 0. Um, I think LSU, I, I get Brian Kelly angry because he didn't win the game. And 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 I kind of I kind of like it because I mean I, I don't it doesn't matter to me if he hits the table. Um people get all fired up with Brian Kelly, but he created a meme. Created the meme. Oh sure. my god. Yeah. Yes. And, and the, go. the the somebody somebody screenshotted. Right when he hit the table, and the water bottle in front of him, in front of him, flew into the air, and they've got the the screenshot is the water bottle off of the table, just it dispelled in midair. It's great. It landed though, right? I guess it did so. not it's spill. Yeah. I don't believe. Good feet. Yeah, yeah. impressive Resilient. effort by the water bottle. Resilient Dasani or whatever it was. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a good game. I think you, you get you get more out of that than beating somebody seventy to zero, right? Um, so I don't think it's it's bad. I think, but I think USC's got to feel really good about the, you know, it, it's all been. Do they have the stuff in the trenches? Can they go up against these Big Ten teams? Well, they went up against LSU uh, and did fine. Very happy for Miller Moss. You know, three years he sat in the program, worked. Um, he's a real cerebral player. A kid really enjoys USC. 
Um, I know I've read some different stuff on him and he just, he, he loves the school. He wants to be a college student. He's into chess, all these different things. And, you know, he goes into last year, the, the season ends, Caleb will obviously sits by Caleb Williams, whatever, um, is the number one draft pick. Lincoln Riley has a press conference before the bowl game. I mean, right, right at the end of the season says, I'm going to bring in two transfer quarterbacks. Well, you know, I've been here, Hey coach. Um, and then they get in the holiday bowl and he wins the job. And, and he's the next day, Lincoln Riley calls him. Now he's scared. Miller Moss is going to leave, right? <laughs> he calls him and says, hey, I'm not taking any veteran quarterbacks, right? And it, and the job was wide open for him. And now he's got it. And he, he looks tremendous. And so I, I love those types of stories. Yeah, very happy for Miller Moss, um, who has put in his time there and gotten his chance, got better, capitalized when he got the opportunity. And yeah, Lincoln Riley tried to recruit over him, and they brought in Malachi Nelson, who was the five star guy that was supposed to be the next guy, you know, replacing Caleb Williams. That didn't work out. Uh, they did bring in Jaden Maiava from UNLV, and he's not beating out Miller Moss. And Miller has played extremely well in his two starts as USC Trojan. Uh, he was really he was very emotional after the game on the field, and then he just kind of bottled that all up, and he was really kind of bland in the post game press conference. We were a little. We were hoping for a little yeah. more. <laughs> yeah. We were walking we out hoping we were getting a little more, but uh, yeah, no vultures, yeah. media no. vultures. That's right. Cry, no, kids. Just Cry. be happy for us. Come on. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, it was it, it was a very good performance by by USC in general. And Deanton Lynn, do we have a rising coaching star? He's 34 years old. He's the son of Anthony Lynn, who was the head coach of the Chargers, was in the been in the NFL forever. Uh, he was the DC last year for UCLA, and their defense got unbelievably better. So Lincoln Riley, big play, goes across town, swipes him, brings him over, and at least after one game, their defense is unbelievably better. They tackled well, which USC, I think, was the worst tackling team in the country in 2022 and 2023. And they they made open field tackles. They made tackles in gaps. They were tough up the middle. They covered. They had a couple of busts, but but you know they they were tough in the red zone. I just thought it was a, an incredible performance that makes me say Deanton Lynn knows what he's doing. Holy moly! They brought in six new six defensive starters via the portal, um, and then the bunch of of other guys who were twenty twenty three transfers in. So. Lincoln said massive changes defensively, and they have been massive, but they're working. That's what impressed me. And one other quick note on LSU, LSU's offense. Um, Kyron Lacey was unbelievable in the first half, and then they didn't get him the ball. And I don't know whether that was, you know, I didn't study it while the game was going on, but whether that was a, an adjustment that Lynn made to say we're taking him away or they just didn't even really press the issue to get him the ball. And the other thing, LSU has elite tackles, Will Campbell and, and Emory Jones. They're better pass blocking tackles than run blocking tackles, I think. And that's Will Campbell's going to make a ton of money as a left tackle in the NFL. But they didn't get a lot of push, I didn't think, as run blockers. Neither the guys inside of them, guard to guard. So that's an area you know Ross talked about. They didn't run the ball well. I, their line may just not be built to pound people. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um yeah, the, the Anton Lynn hire, obviously, um, you know, maybe one of the best coordinator hires, maybe the best one that we saw in the offseason. It had a lot of buzz around it. Took him from UCLA. Um, Lincoln Riley did. And Lincoln Riley almost sounded uh, surprised in his own defense afterward um, <laughs> that they yeah. trusted the system and the new players trusted the system like they did on a big stage and it, it was just, I kind of wrote this, but it was kind of almost like he internally was saying, did we really do that? Are we sure that was us? Uh, it just kind of what it, what it felt like, but yeah, that was one of the most impressive things. And look, there were a lot of, um, back to Miller Moss real quick. I mean, there were a lot of great quarterback play week one. We, we saw plenty of great stats and maybe I'm biased because we were just at the game, but I think his performance was the best uh, on that stage um, against a defense at LSU that's been improved. And he just made some really, really good throws. And, and he put his receivers in great spots to make phenomenal catches, which they did. Uh, yeah. Kyron Hudson oh. had 
two catches that were the best. Um, I mean, the two catches in that game from him might end up being two of the best we see all season. The one-handed catch and then the catch late on the drive that set up the game-winning touchdown where he was just hit. He was targeted, literally targeted, and he hung on to the ball. And again, that catch was that catch was like a perfect throw in stride uh, from Miller Moss. It was, yeah, it, if I'm Big Ten defenses, uh, I'm a, I'm a little, little – uh, Anxious for that for that game against those uh, USC players, and if they can play defensively and tackle like we saw, they can they can win that league for sure. Yeah, impressive. Uh, all right, we got a Diego Pavea update. We'll get Uh-oh. to right after this message. Mexico Tinkler, you know we love Diego. Pat's the Albuquerque Tinkler because he did some stuff on the. Who playing for NC State? New Mexico State, not NC State. New Mexico State. He's on the logo at the New Mexico thing. Comes a legend, wins the game. Uh, goes to Vanderbilt. Uh, somebody in Vanderbilt is just messing with them, and they know how to push the buttons. So here is a quote by Brent Pry, the Virginia Tech coach, before the Virginia Tech Vanderbilt game. And I start. We didn't get this on the on the overreaction show because we missed it, but. He is praising how good Diego is as a player. The guy, this guy is the ultimate competitor. He's tough as nails. You know, he extends plays and he's got no fear. A Brent Pry used to coach at Penn State. He reminds me a little bit of a guy we had at Penn State named Trace McSorley. Kind of the way the play he plays the game. Very determined quarterback. Now, this is a, quite a nice quote. Who wouldn't want the opposing coach saying things like that about it? Also quite accurate to the way he plays. After beating Virginia Tech, Diego says, some people over there, meaning Virginia Tech, called me a poor man's Trace McSorley. When you stop me, then you can talk. Now, two points. One, no one called him a poor man's Trace McSorley. He says he played like, he reminds me a little bit of a guy we had, Trace McSorley. So he got somebody threw some fake news at Diego. <laughs> Poor Brent. Are you catching two? Trace McSorley has put a little respect on the guy's name. He won 31 games at Penn State and made it four years in the NFL, albeit as a backup. He's not Patrick Mahomes, but poor man's Trace McSorley is pretty damn good. This is motivational genius, is it not, Pat? Does does Diego oh, yeah. even know who Trace McSorley is? <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, there's a lot of quarterbacks who would love to be compared to Trace McSorley. That guy was a really good college player, and as you said, he's been in the NFL. Uh, but this probably goes into the rich history of coaches if need be, exaggerating, <laughs> embellishing, yes. doctoring on a quote to to turn it into bulletin board material. Fire up the team, yeah. Yeah. Look, they don't think you're any good. Yeah, like you're they Trace think you're McSorley. Man, Trace McSorley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're a so, transfer from uh, New Mexico State. Who, uh, poor Trace <laughs> McSorley, too. He's like, what is going on? Yeah. How did I get He's involved in this? He's getting dragged into this, yeah. And that's... Which quarterback in New Mexico State history wouldn't like to be compared to Trace McSorley? Yeah. So uh, it's a high compliment, frankly, for Diego. But whatever it takes to, quote, unquote, piss him off. Yeah. Let him go. <laughs> Good one. Certainly worked. Certainly worked. All right. Speaking of quarterbacks, uh, biggest game this weekend is is Texas at uh, Michigan. Uh, should, be, uh, should be excellent. Uh, and Michigan uh, – Quarterback has been the storyline. Who's going to play quarterback for Michigan? And uh, they had kind of a surprise starter on uh, against Fresno State. Sharon Moore went with uh, Davis Warren. And Davis Warren, let me tell you the story. You probably know nothing about him because he was one of these guys. They kept saying, everyone thought it would be Alex Orgy would be the starter. Ah, he's in comp- competition with all these guys. And everyone waits because they don't want the kids to transfer out, right? So I kind of was like, yeah, Davis Warren, what? Davis Warren was a high school sophomore, and he got uh, leukemia, 2019. Gets uh, leukemia and 
has to t- go under radiation and all that, or chemo, whatever, loses 40 pounds and all his hair, comes back, is determined to come back and play. It's actually was going to be his senior year. He ends up reclassifying, but what it turns out to be his junior year. He's determined to play in 2019 because he's trying to get tape out there and stuff like that. Uh, he's playing at a school in New Jersey. He gets back on the field, but he's that he's only 160 pounds and gets back for the middle of the season, but he has to take blood tests every week to see whether he's capable of getting out on the field, like whatever the blood work shows. Okay. He second to last game, they're playing Princeton Hun school, which is a big program. This would be a big opportunity for him. He does not get the blood work, right? He sees on the internet, some story that if you drink papaya j- juice extract, it can help. <laughs> So he orders a ton of papaya juice extract off of Amazon. Holy Loads up on it during the game all week and passes his blood test. All right. Steps in, goes five of six, 126 yards. Okay. Plays the game. This is how much he wants to play. But still, he's just, he's, he's nothing. His, uh, there's something happens in the program. The coach leaves, a bunch of the players leave. So he needs a new school. So he goes to Suffield up in, uh, in uh, Connecticut, which has a ton of D1 players. And they had Tyler Van Dyke went there, who played, I think he was at Miami recently and all different, you know, he's a college program. So the coaches there know what a D1 player looks like. And he shows up, but it's for 2020. There's no season, right? No COVID comes. He's got no season. So he's got some practice footage with these guys at Suffield. They start talking around to coaches and they're trying to hype him up. Otherwise, he's He's either heading to the Patriot League or maybe Duke. Duke was kind of in on it, too. He moves back to L.A. and he's taking online classes. He takes his SAT one day, one Saturday, comes home, and Jim Harbaugh has called and says, I'm going to offer you. I saw some practice tape, and they're they're talking you up over here at this other school, at this school, preferred walk-on to Michigan, right? So he takes the preferred walk-on. He's in J.J. McCarthy's class. Freshman year, scout team player of the year. Spends apparently spends all his time with Cade McNamara watching film, all this stuff and stuff. 2022, he gets in and goes five for nine. Last year, he gets in and is 0 for five with a pick. That was his that was his stats last year. 0 for five with a pick. And then somehow wins the Michigan job. So we have a leukemia survivor, a, a, a papaya juice extract uh, aficionado, a preferred walk on a scout team player of the year. And he's now the starting quarterback going up against Quinn Ewers and uh, and uh, Arch Manning in the game of the week. Now, this is why I love college football is crazy stories like this. Right now, this will not get him one yard against the Longhorns, mind you. <laughs> OK, <laughs> we'll see what reality may come on at noon. But I love stuff like this. What a story by this guy. That's fantastic. I, I a lot of backstory I did not know there, and uh, good for him. I mean, the leukemia thing's incredible. I, the papaya juice part sounds a little Connor Stallions esque. It's like, uh, how, how far are we going to take this here? That's probably why but, Harbaugh, uh, Harbaugh heard the papaya juice story. It was, oh yeah, I know about that. Yeah, that I guarantee that, that sounds like the kind of thing that could tip the scales and say, I'm offering that guy a walk on. A lot of so, this is from uh, Ryan Zook from M Live. I read about this. It was okay. an old story when they signed or they committed. But anyway, yeah. so go ahead. But yeah, no, uh, you know, I I watched parts of them that Michigan game off and on quarterback play. Eh. But uh, and as a matter of fact, I think the graphic they showed which had Alex Orgy in the starting lineup on NBC and then out comes Davis Warren. So there was a little bit of uh, trickeration there from from Michigan. But. You know, we'll see what they roll out. They're going to have to be better than they were against Fresno, but, uh, you know, give them a chance. I'll be there. I'll be there in the big house. Dan, I think you'll be there I will. as well, right? I will be there. Yes. Yeah. Um, th- I'll, be, I'll be on my couch. You'll be on your couch. Thoughts on, on Texas, Michigan, early thoughts. We'll pick the game later in the week, Ross. Yeah, well, they're good. like Pat said, they're going to have to be better, right? I mean, Davis Warren is a great story, but uh, 15 of 25, 118 yards and a touchdown and interceptions, probably not going to beat Texas. So they've, they've got to be they've got to be better there. Um, I know they ran the ball pretty consistently against Fresno, um, but uh, all around, you, you they're going to be uh, faced with a pretty big test here from, uh, from Texas and a, a 
Texas defensive front, like uh, I mean, it, it'll I mean, it will probably be the biggest right game in Davis's career no, uh, okay. by far. I'm sure. So other than the papaya juice stage? extract game, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. You do love those stories, um, you know. You, you, and hey, we probably won't have as many of those walk on turn starting quarterback for a, a big blue blood power like that. We won't have as many uh, in the future um, with the changes coming to college athletics. So it's good to, uh, it's good to see it. And uh, it, it, that was one of the bigger quarterback surprises. I think of the, um, of week one is that he, he got not just the first snap, but played pretty much the whole, the whole game. They brought Orgy in for nine plays so that, you know, an Orgy maybe was more running. He did throw a little, uh, you know, we'll see. They're trying to piece it together, obviously. Uh, this Texas team looked f- just fantastic against Colorado State. And um, there's a real chance for, I think, Texas to make it. Michigan's got a nice defense. They have they have a couple. They have some elite. They may have the best cornerback. They may have the best tight end. Uh, and Colson Loveland, and Will Johnson. They got some unbelievable – they got a great D-line. They got some unbelievable talent. I don't know if they've got enough to handle what Texas has got, which just looks um, on paper and then what they showed against Colorado State to be uh, pretty pretty awesome. All right, one other big game you're going to hear a lot about this week is uh, Colorado – visiting nebraska there's much to be made this is obviously an old rivalry Deion sanders said he loved it because this was a game that old they were old rivals when he was he remembers watching when he was younger um it is two different ways to build a program which i think is getting a ton of hype uh matt rule is focused very much on recruiting high school players and building up although not exclusively but then on the on the other side colorado is uh, bringing in everyone in the transfer it's already rule was already asked about the culture class and uh rule said not at all i think they're a competitive culture they go recruit and get the best players they can get they do well in school they don't get in trouble off the field and they compete i respect that with what they do uh good answer but uh how excited are you for this game uh oh, pat extremely and i will say they're they're like four interesting Big Ten home games this week. We got Texas going to Michigan. We got Colorado at Nebraska. We have Boise at Oregon, classic Big Ten uh, venue there, and uh, Iowa State at Iowa. So we'll see see a little bit more about what the Big Ten's got going on. But uh, I, you know, I think I think Nebraska fans and players are going to be juiced out of their minds for this game because a, you know, the old the old heads hate Colorado, but B, they watch Colorado not just beat them, but pound them down and then storm the field. And Nebraska really hadn't been worth storming the field for years, but Colorado did it. And that was some old school. We hate you and we're going to celebrate whooping you. And I think Nebraska fans would love nothing more than to turn those tables around. And they feel like they've got a better team and a chance to do it. Certainly better at quarterback. Jeff Sims was a disaster last year in that game against Colorado. Dylan Rayola, he's a freshman, so you never know. But he was an awfully good freshman in that opener. So I'm I'm super excited. See, uh, the Buffaloes, they've got some extremely good individual talent. They've got some moxie. They've got playmakers. Do they have line play on both sides to protect Shadour Sanders and to run the ball and then to – get a pass rush, which the things that they, they really didn't do very well against North Dakota state. Yeah. That's a problem with Colorado, right? Is um, they've got these two incredible players in Shadir and in uh, Travis Hunter, but they still struggle doing the fundamental things like um, blocking and tackling um, still seems to be a problem in areas and against Nebraska, who I think, can block and tackle pretty well, um, although we haven't we haven't seen it against great competition. Uh, that's going to be that's going to be the issue. Can can Colorado's defense do enough to um, to give Shador Sanders time? Um, one and two, uh, slow down Rayola and um, you know their their offense because uh, we we saw some explosive plays from them in that game. I didn't get to watch a whole lot of Nebraska, but. 
heard that Rayola looked really, really good and really mature. All the buzz from camp seems to be real and, and uh, true on him that he's kind of mature uh, beyond the years sort of thing. And uh, that's going to be a tough one. That, 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 that'll be – I'm, I'm excited for that one, but I, I could also see that one being a four-touchdown game. I am looking for the moment Dylan Rayola tries to challenge Travis Hunter. <laughs> mm. Now I there imagine the Nebraska game plan will yeah. be let's let's try not to throw at Travis Hunter. But yeah. what I know so far about Dylan Rayola is I'm gonna throw it at Travis Hunter. Like that kid wants to see if he can whip it past him. <laughs> I'm looking forward yeah. to that moment. That's gonna be a, a a clash. So uh very very interesting game. And yeah, Iowa fans, pace yourselves this week. Iowa and Iowa State. I know it's a big week for you. Okay. Pace yourself. We know it's gonna get it's gonna get rowdy out there. Um, get a lot of tap water in you get, before the week. Drink some drink some Ames water. I, I'm looking at you, Iowa State fans. You tend to get a little little more off the rails than the, than the Hawkeyes. <laughs> um, yeah, hydrate, hydrate. It's gonna be big. All right, we'll be back right after this. Mountain West and Pac-12, which is the Pac-2, did not renew a scheduling agreement what do we know about this and what does it mean the washington state and oregon state are going to have to basically go independent scheduling uh what's the latest ross you know anything well it depends it depends they they you know they still could uh first of all they could they could still at some point reach a deal um they they just they did go over the deadline but i think they could reach a deal number one number two i do think that amount uh that um oregon state and washington state could still uh individually strike deals with Mountain West teams to, to schedule them along with others, right? Yeah, they could piece together a schedule. There's some ACC teams, I believe, that have some openings on a schedule, um, including two out West, um, Stanford and Cal. So they could piece together things. Um, but one wonders what this means, though, for, the, for even the future beyond the second year of this when Oregon State and Washington State have to find a conference or have to rebuild the Pac-12 uh, you know, does it have anything to do with the fact that they're not entering in an agreement with the Mountain West for year two, at least not yet, that they've gone through the deadline? Does it have anything to do with the expansion penalties that are attached to this contract originally? And I'll explain a little bit of what that what that was, because I don't know that we talked about it on the show, but um if the organ there's obviously fear from the Mountain West and the Mountain West Commissioner of Gloria Navarez that the that the Pac Pac twelve will try to rebuild by taking some Mountain West teams. That's been out there, I think, pretty public for the last year or so that they were going to pluck maybe the best of the Mountain West to rebuild. So before they enter their deal, wisely, the Mountain West uh, put in the, this scheduling contract a clause that included very stiff penalties. As much as sixty, eighty million dollars worth of penalties, depending on how many teams, if if the Pac-12 were to take Mountain West teams during this contract, um, it, it would it would incur extra penalties, more than just exit fees from Mountain West teams. So you do wonder if you know part of the reason they're not entering year two is because they don't want to incur those penalties if they do plan on taking some of those Mountain West teams. Uh, it feels like we're a long way or at least a few months away from any of that happening expansion wise. But that's the first thing that popped in my head over this. Yeah. I, I mean, it seems to me it's kind of we're keeping our options open. Uh, yeah. We like to keep you on, you know, keep your keep your number in the phone. But, hey, we got some other numbers in here, too. We're trying to work some things out and uh, that. Probably both the, the Mountain West aspires to to bring in Washington State and Oregon State and Oregon State and Washington State are like, well, we might aspire to that eventually, but only when we're out of other options. So uh, I think they're going to keep dancing as long as they have to until they eventually, I would still think it would make sense for them to come together. But as Ross said, there's, there's, there's many, many, many dollars and, and other complications that could make that. Uh, a bit of a drawn out process. You also never know what's going to happen. No. Yeah. No. Right. Especially with the ACC uncertainty, mm. 
in a situation. Um, you hear a lot of that from the Pac-12 folks and Oregon State and Washington State folks is, look, we don't know what's going to happen with the landscape out east with the, the ACC. And maybe nothing will happen, but we just don't know. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty there that could impact their future. You know, so they, they uh, as Pat said, I think um, keeping, keeping the options open uh, for the next few months is, is probably a wise move. Uh, okay. And then briefly, um, you reported the NCAA was changing its uh, thinking of extending uh, its red shirt rules to all sports, uh, the football red shirt rules. What's going on there? Yeah. So like as part of that, uh, part of the house settlement, um, a lot of NCAA rules need to change amateurism rules. And they're, they're going to start, on a year long review of NCAA rules and like change all these things and update these rules to align with the house settlement. And one of them, I think the biggest one probably is, as you mentioned, the red shirt rule, you know, there's a red shirt rule in football where you can play a fifth season in a, in a fit. You can play in a fifth season up to a certain amount. It's four regular season games and then still take a red shirt that exists in no other sport except wrestling, where you can play even more than one snap of a fifth season. And, and still preserve your ability to, to take your red shirt. Um, and, uh, and they're thinking about spreading that rule, basically you just so having the football rule for all sports, which basketball and baseball coaches I heard from over the weekend rejoice because you can imagine, you know, a basketball player plays one, 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 uh, one minute of one game and, um, and that's it, right? Use the eligibility. So now each sport will have to decide how much of that season that they can play to, t- to take a red shirt. It'll probably be around 25 to 30% of the regular season contest. So in basketball around what, Pat, like eight to 10 games or so, something like that maybe. And uh, baseball, um, maybe a, a little more than that. Um, the baseball is a, a longer schedule. So there's that change, which is a pretty big change. I think the other change, and we we may have talked about this a while because it's been discussed for a, a long time now, and it's the elimination of the national letter of intent, um, getting rid of it in basically rolling national letter of intent uh, stuff uh, benefits into just regular financial aid agreements, which now will come with obviously revenue sharing agreements too. And all this will be, that that's what players will sign um, you know, going forward, there's some other changes too, but, uh, a lot of minuscule stuff. I mean, players can now, will be able to take prize money before they enroll, you know, that used to not be possibility players overseas, Dan, like in soccer, European players can maybe play a few games actually professionally, as long as they don't take money, uh, from the team and actually then still enroll in college. So there's some like pre-enrollment changes as well. Being lightening made. up here, lightening up. Yeah. Lighten up. I see that. I like that. I see that. I see that. I see that. Um Yeah, I think all these kids, I mean, let's, let's let them play, right? Let them play. Um all right. We have an update here on People's Court. Uh wrap this Uh-oh. up. Uh you know, we've covered extensively the case of Vera Liddell, the uh woman in uh, Illinois, she worked at the uh food services for a school district Harvey and yeah. uh, was uh, found uh, guilty of stealing one and a half million dollars in chicken wings. Yeah. Uh, more than 11,000 cases of chicken wings that she bought and then apparently resold to pay for a gambling habit. <laughs> <laughs> Described as a sweet woman with a gambling problem. And uh, uh. she funded it with the illegal chicken wing uh this is how she funded her gambling problem yeah this has got to be the most bizarre baby unusual way to fund that's why we that's why we it's it's a it's a i think we decided did she deserve to go to i think we ruled on this at one point um uh, maybe forgot of all the stupid stories we do on the people's court um anyway she was sentenced to nine years Uh, i don't think we thought she should get so much uh for the chicken wing heist the uh Cook County uh, judicial system was less impressed with the absurdity <laughs> of this of this uh, deal. Um, however, uh, Kansas City Chief Defensive Tackle and former Mississippi State Bulldog Chris Jones uh, 
put on uh, social media that I will pay for the wings that she stole to get her free. Oh, my. Out of nowhere, Chris Jones is willing to drop a million and a half (laughs) because he feels feels for Vera Liddell, 68-year-old woman going to the Hooska for nine years (laughs) for stealing chicken wings. Um, so he's willing to drop a million and a half and, uh, they, so uh, legally this wouldn't hurt. Let's put it that way. Making restitution would help. Perhaps they would lower the sentence, but, uh, much to be, much to be seen. It's not as simple as just, here's the chickens, chicken wings back. Uh, one of the red flags here was they don't serve chicken wings to call to high school and middle school kids because of the bones. Because yeah, okay. it's, 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 someone's going to choke, right? So they yeah, do chicken sure, nuggets sure. Uh, or course. boneless wings, as of we, course. of course, debated. So you're not, you, yeah. I mean, because I was like, what school do you get like wings? That's like yeah, pretty sweet. Right. I would go there. How psyched are you if it's wing day? Yeah, I'd transfer there. Absolutely. Hot, I mean, different sauces. This would be great. No, that was part of the, what caught their attention. 11,000 cases of chicken wings at a place that does not serve chicken wings. <laughs> she didn't cover her tracks. Yeah, there was well some here. problems. Was, yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, but I could, I, I re, rebring the people's court together on the case of Vera um, or Vera or whatever. Um, if Chris Jones buys the wings, <laughs> should she get out? Justice 40. Uh, you know, it's interesting, I guess, what tugs at your heartstrings and where you want to give your money charitably and to the <laughs> the gambling addict chicken wing thief. I mean, you know, okay. I mean, I have some sympathy for her, for sure, but that, that's an interesting move by Chris Jones. Uh, I would at least, I would, I would, I would be willing to reduce her sentence, certainly. I don't want to put a 68-year-old gambling addict in prison for, for nine years. So get her some, some addiction therapy and cut her sentence to like two years and have Chris Jones go and distribute the wings to the high schools that didn't get them to begin with. Let those kids have a celebratory wing day, (laughs) wherever the heck this is in Chicago. (laughs) Uh, What Chris Jones's addition to this story He's not uh, even from Chicago. Bizarre. He's from Houston, <laughs> Mississippi. It, 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 no, like, this what? is a Miss, this is this is a fellow bulldog, uh, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, you Mississippi I mean, State guys have big hearts. He's from Houston, Mississippi, a small town in Mississippi, uh, and oh, he yeah. plays in the Kansas uh, City Chiefs. Yeah. Why is he d- dipping into this like in, into this story? Uh, I don't know, but God bless bizarre. him. He wants maybe his, maybe he's got a grandma who's a gambling uh, yeah, addict. Who knows? Yeah, get out in those river boats. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That tunica, yeah, Vicksburg. Yep, you gotta watch it. Um geez. That's weird. Um, maybe it's just a thing with chicken chicken wings. He wants to set the wings free, Dan. Would you so what what do you think? Would you I don't know. <laughs> I mean Thank flip you. it. I, I, I flip a flip a wing, Dan. Flip a wing and, and see how it lands. I like the idea of like a wing fest. <laughs> I don't think you get the chi- she stole the chicken wings over. I mean, those chicken wings would be expired by now. You don't want to. Yeah, eat by now they don't want to eat those. Twenty nineteen, yeah. I yeah. think. If, yeah. <laughs> also, the I'm fascinated. I've just. I mean, I've read. I read like six stories on this, including the New York Times. No one could explain the underground black market chicken wing. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is? Wait, am I eating stolen wings ever? I mean, what is happening? Where is this chicken wing? F- Look, she's. You know, let's say she's got a, you know, like a Ford Explorer. She pulls up somewhere and opens the back trunk and says, I got, you know, cases of chicken wings to sell you. Marks them up a Hopefully little bit. Hopefully she's got them cold. I, oh, yeah. 11,000? Yes, 11,000 11, cases make, of chicken wings? She's making this? periodic, periodic deliveries. It, like every Tuesday oh. in the neighborhood. She's I mean, where is she say, keeping right. them even at her house? <laughs> what is going on? I get that there's some shady like restaurants be like, hey, I get half marked off chicken wings. I'm just going to do it, whatever. But like, I understand like the underground diamond market or something. I, I don't know. But <laughs> how many restaurants are there out there getting this little old ladies dropping on the way to the riverboat. 
the the number of uh, things you could do to fund your gambling habit this would be like low on the list <laughs> hey, mean, it worked for a God, while it, right? yeah, it worked for a while yeah i mean I what if so. she won on, she could have paid it back if she'd just been a little luckier at the slots or whatever Maybe That's this it, is some man. deal she's doing with the casino buffet where she's owed money. Maybe, oh, that would be a twist. Oh, casino buffet chicken wings. There you go. Yeah. Careful. You got a job. I mean, I'm always excited to have a chicken wing, but um, this is even more exciting because you don't know if it's a stolen wing or not. So someone's sitting around being like, those wings I had in 2019 in a kind of <laughs> shady little joint in Chicago might have been stolen. <laughs> It's the stolen wings. Anyway, uh, enjoy your wings, whether they're whether they're they're hot or not. I guess you could hot wings, right? Hot wings. There you go. Uh, all right, we'll be back Thursday with uh, we'll do race to the case. We'll pick all the big games. It's a, a bunch of good games this weekend. So excellent week two. Week one was fantastic. Everyone's fired up for the season. We appreciate everybody listening, sharing us on social media, hunting us out, uh, watching us on YouTube, all of that. Uh, thank you for that. We're excited for the season, obviously, and we will talk to you later.